Um, the research reflected on in this presentation links to a, a set of wider debates over reparations for descendants of enslaved peoples, which sort of explains that slightly curious title. And a recent broader academic mobilization around the notion of reparative histories. This has been characterized by a desire to address contemporary social injustices, particularly those connected to race, through the researching and telling of new histories which make issues of race, enslavement, and colonialism more visible. I'm, I'm from a, a historical cultural geography background, so, and I'm the PI of the, the project that this, this presentation is based on. So this paper really discusses the achievements and challenges of work that might be characterized as a reparative historical geography of rural cotton textile production associated with the Derwent Valley in Derbyshire. But why is there a need for this work? Well, firstly, there continues to be a lack of coverage of histories of enslavement and colonialism in British heritage venues, particularly those in rural settings. For example, much of the research which was conducted around the bicentenary in 2007 of the abolition of the British slave trade in relation to country houses has typically at best led to only temporary engagements with these legacies and at worst to a failure to integrate such perspectives into country house venues. And the examination of slavery and colonial linkages in the context of rural textile venues has been even less Apparent, although there has been more work in urban textile venues. A second um, motivation is that such absences have led to feelings of exclusion and alienation being reported by black, Asian and minority ethnic groups visiting heritage venues. And this is reported in the literature. Um, but also personal experience, people telling me they've stopped going to country houses because their histories are not being told. And also in the broader countryside, and there's a, there's a whole legacy of, there's a whole history of, of work on, on issues about race in the British countryside. These findings point towards the complex interactions that exist between past and present. Current um, black, Asian and minority ethnic groups feel alienated in rural heritage venues when their histories are ignored. Furthermore, as proponents of public history and black historians such as Stuart Hall have pointed out, the histories presented are informed by present day social relations, which influence what is deemed worthy of remembering and presenting from the past. And the dominant view still regards the countryside as a white space and typically reflects the values of mainstream society, dominated by male, white and or elite perspectives. This leads to continued celebration of great white men, their treasures or genius, and stories geared to entertainment and reassurance of mainstream social perspectives. Competing, of, competing versions of the past, highlighted by public history and associated, for example, with perspectives of working people, women, and um, black and Asian and minority, and minority ethnic groups, are still less commonly voiced. <coughs> Another important issue here relates to the sensitivities around how to tell such stories of the impacts of enslavement and colonisation. And these are, are genuine and serious challenges which should not be underestimated. But they shouldn't deflect from the telling of the stories. Because if one doesn't tell these stories, there's a danger of reinscribing and perpetuating colonial attitudes. And the productive way of proceeding is through the involvement of, of black, Asian, and minority ethnic groups themselves in this work. So the Global Cotton Connections project on which this presentation draws attempted to challenge and address these silences in cotton histories. It was funded for a year by the AHRC's Connected Communities Programme, and, and it, it focused, as I said before, on the Durham Valley. Now, an, now a World Heritage Site because of its um, being an important site of industrial innovation based on cotton. It sought to reconnect that, that particular site with people and places from around the globe involved who have made a contribution to cotton textile production development in the past and those who have an interest in it in the 
present. And the, the aim and objective of the project is set out on this slide. But really what we're trying to do is to use processes of archival investigation and community co-reflection and co-production to, to, um, through the project. And this involved the creation of new heritage objects by African and Asian diaspora groups involved in, in the project. So who were these groups? Well, um, how were they brought together? Well, the project purposely sought to bring together different types of participants from different traditions and heritage backgrounds. So in an academic sphere, there were geographers and a historian. Um, in a more community-based sphere, there was a mainly African-Caribbean heritage group from Nottingham, many of whom have enslaved ancestors, and a Hindu faith group, mainly of Indian heritage background from Sheffield. And there were also heritage representatives from the Durban Valley Mills World Heritage Site and the Outright Society involved. Um, the Nottingham Slave Trade Legacies Group was facilitated by a community organisation called Right Ideas Nottingham under a Slave Trade Legacies banner and in conjunction with a heritage lottery project that they had. Um, the Sheffield Hindu Samaj Heritage Group was already formed and already worked on um, the British Raj in the Peak District under a Heritage Lottery Fund project. Um, the Arkwright Society owns and manages the site of the world's first successful water power cotton spinning mill at Cromford, which is the centrepiece of the Dome Pally Mills World Heritage Site, and its volunteers have strong interests in industrial archaeology and mill life. And these are the groups that were brought together. So the project has undertaken case study research, case study historical research, mainly based on the Strutt family who owned mills at Belper, Milford and Derby, with a focus on the cotton connections in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. And at this time, the Strutts were leading cotton thread producers. Jedediah previously worked with Richard Arkwright at the original mill in Cromford. And I want to highlight two key elements of the historical research, um, the first of which relates to mapping raw cotton supplies used by the struts, and the second which relates to tracing the nature of raw cotton suppliers. And we cho chose to do these two things in a very small project, which didn't have much time to do historical research, because we felt that these were powerful ways of countering a curtailed narrative of raw cotton origins found in some of the mill heritage sites. Namely, that cotton came on pack horse from Liverpool. So in analysing the raw cotton supplies of the Struts, we've drawn on some really old, much older research from 1958, a classic study of, of, of an industrialist by Fitton and Wadsworth who looked at the Struts and the Arkwrights. And what we've done is use the data that they've put together on raw cotton supplies from 1794 to 1817 for the struts based on the number of bags and mapped it and that's what the, the upper um, map shows. And the broad picture shows a pattern in which most of the cotton was being derived from the Americas where slave, enslaved African labour was being used to produce cotton. Um, Brazil was the most important um, source with about half of the, of the supplies coming from there. About a fifth came from the West Indies and a similar amount from the area of modern Guyana and Suriname. And the southern states contributed about a tenth and there were smaller amounts from the Indian subcontinent and a few other places in South America and Europe. To sort of complement and test the accuracy of using bag data, we did some mapping of um, from a cotton ledger um, based on the weight of cotton bought and the second map re reflects that um, in a slightly different way um, and for the comparable years we, we find that the importance of the West Indies as a, as a source for the struts is heightened and it becomes almost as important a source as, as South America during, during this 1790s period and almost a quarter of their raw cotton in this period was coming from a very small Caribbean island called Cariacou, which is just north of, of Grenada and was part of Grenada in the Windward Islands. 
And this links up to our second strategy of tracing suppliers. Here again, we analyse the 1799 account, which is included in the Fitton and Wattsworth book, um, which is their account with their Liverpool broker, Nicholas Waterhouse. And this shows that the Struts dealt with a number of Liverpool merchants who were well-known slave traders, including the Boltons, the Earls, and the Tartans, who owned, many of, who owned plantations in the Americas worked by enslaved Africans. And I want to focus here on Thomas Tartan, who alone supplied nearly a quarter of the cotton that the, the struts sourced by a waterhouse in 1799. And as Kariakou was such an important area in this period, it's likely that Tartan drew on supplies from his own cotton plantation on that island. And this was called Mount Pleasant. It was a 509-acre property worked by 227 enslaved Africans in 1790. And when slavery was abolished in the British colonies, Tartan's family received compensation of, of just over £6,500 for 256 enslaved people um, um, in relation to that property. Now this links quite interestingly to, to some work of a, a contemporary genealogist, um, Abigail Bernard, who's a present day descendant who's researched her ancestors on the estate and her work provides a sort of living link between the Struts, Derbyshire cotton supplies, enslaved Africans, and black British women today. And that sort of leads me into the second part of what we've been doing, which is to work with the community groups. And to develop the community group involvement in the research, we, we held a series of community-based activities. Firstly, both community groups had individual start-up work workshops in Nottingham and Sheffield, the Nottingham one in conjunction with their ideas and their Heritage Lottery Fund project. And the project was introduced and, and some updates on historical research was given. And then the second phase was to run two joint visits to Derbyshire um, with a strong focus on mill sites in the Derwent Valley. And that was done in the summer um, 2014. And follow-up events and workshops were then held to develop thinking on heritage legacy materials. And this included an element of sharing ideas in workshops held in November 2014, when some of the Nottingham group went to Sheffield and some of the Sheffield group came to Nottingham. And drawing on those discussions, the groups were, were given the freedom to decide what they wanted to create from these, from these projects in terms of their own heritage legacy outcomes. So as we've seen at lunchtime, those of you who are here, the Nottingham group focused on making this film, Global Cotton Connections, Untangling the Threads of Slavery, um, which is available on YouTube. And the Sheffield Hindu Samaj Heritage Group, they ran a series of creating write, creative writing workshops and produced um, a couple of different things. One was an illustrated poetry collection there are some examples of that over on the table if anyone's interested in it. And a leaflet, a walks leaflet, um, illustrating um, a cotton heritage route, which drew on work from their previous HLF project as well as the Global Cotton Connections project. And the legacies materials of both groups were presented to public audiences last summer at Cromford Mills during the AHRC Connected Communities Festival fortnight. But perhaps the most significant contribution in the sites that both the historical and the community-based work is making has been to input into the new Derwent Valley Mills World Heritage Site Gateway Visitor Centre, which is due to open at Cromford Mills on the 1st of February. But the date keeps changing, so don't, don't hold into that. And that, that initiative has been funded in part by the Heritage Lottery Fund. It's managed by the Arkwright Society as the owners of the site, their trustees, and it involves consultants, as well as the World Heritage Site. In terms of um, contributions then, um, what have we done? Well, we've made some input into the text that's been used in this visitor centre, um, supplying historical information on raw cotton supplies, using the struts as an example, and the global cotton story in the later 18th and early to mid 19th century. And this has also been used to inform guide um, narratives at Cromford. 
Um, the visual elements, however, have proved more contentious and controversial. Here, the, des the designers proposed a twist to a portrait wall designed to show the founders of the valley, which is illustrated here. Alongside the great men of the Industrial Revolution, I think these are mainly Arkwrights and Struts being illustrated here, um, the, the designers proposed including a portrait of an unknown black man alongside these great, great industrialists. Um, and the, I won't go into this, I, following um, some complexities, the, the GCC and the Slave Trade Legacies Group were asked to comment on this proposal. And it, we rejected this proposal. And the quote below sums up from one of the slave trade legacies group, sums up the views expressed that such an isolated inclusion would confuse rather than enlighten. So in place of the portrait wall, what we suggested was a broader landscape um, illustration of enslaved African cotton growers, factory workers, and Indian weavers to reflect the different elements of the cotton story. This advice was accepted. The portrait wall, however, was retained, but minus the black figure. And a new landscape sketch produced for comment by the, um, the trustees and the World Heritage Site, but also our groupings. And this is, this is the sketch that we saw. Um, um, further feedback from both groups highlighted the need for the landscape to show a greater sense of the condition of enslavement in relation to the enslaved African cotton growers and toil and hardship in the sketch as a whole. And some specific um, suggestions were that an overseer figure be in, in, integrated in the plantation scene and that plain children were not really um, appropriate in the context of the mill. We await whether that, that feedback was taken on board or not. Okay, so just to make a couple of concluding reflections. Making reparative historical geographies faces a number of challenges. In the particular case of cotton in the Doman Valley, black and Asian minor and minority and ethnic histories are being brought forward in a context of an emergent industrial archeology span tradition, which contrasts to the established glamour and public popularity of nearby country house venues such as Chatsworth. So I think this, this helps inform a desire there to retain a traditional founding father's perspective, but with some openness to representing the condition of cotton workers in Derbyshire and elsewhere. This is somewhat countered by a desire to make venues commercially viable, and a lack of experience in the area with dealing with colonial and, and enslavement perspectives, and with black, Asian and minority ethnic groups. I'd say that's quite normal in rural heritage areas. And what we found is a spectrum of stances amongst the mill guides and staff, from interest and desire to learn, to some naivety, some ignorance, and some more outright resistance. And um, I think maybe the naivety is reflected in this quote from a Cromford volunteer last summer, why are there so many foreigners visiting the mill today? The general neglect of, of these black and Asian and minority ethnic perspectives at the site provoked similar feelings of hurt, frustration and alienation in the Indian heritage and the African Caribbean groups. So there's some similarities there. However, the two groups did bring different perspectives, with the Hindu Samaj group having more concerns over colonial impacts and the slave trade legacies group, highlighting more present day legacies of enslavement in their own lived experience. Finally, I want to highlight some challenges of the academic role, as I'm an academic speaking and sort of on behalf of the project. Firstly, there was a challenge of working as a, a broker, working as a broker, developing an interactional expertise, which involved giving up a role of a neutral um, expert and being prepared to listen and learn from the groups we were involved with. Secondly, there is always a challenge for me personally as work, of working as a white academic in this context. Um, so, you know, one of the comments I've got, Suzanne, why are you always with a white person? And just one of the sacred legacy groups said to me. And that's a challenge to me personally, it's a challenge to me and my institution. 
why is my institution so white? Why do we see things mainly from those perspectives? Why aren't there more um, black, uh, Asian, and minority ethnic groups working in universities? And a, th a third challenge to me is, is working beyond the official project, sustaining the collaboration and input. Um, attempting to avoid the view that was said to me so many times, that academics just come in, grab and run. <coughs> and believe me, in Nottingham there's a lot of scepticism about academics. So since the main project ended in April last year, the interest has been sustained by working with small pots of money and the goodwill of my community participants and of academic colleagues. And I'd like to end by thanking all the people who have been involved and supported the work. Thank you. It doesn't have to be for this group, but let's start with Suzanne. Uh, Suzanne, I thought that was interesting, the notion of the portraits and the blend of black portraits. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, that needs to be responded to. And it's not very fair because I've only just seen a small one, but. Um, no, I think it's right to change. We've been to include all the sort of workers involved in this other sketch you've got, but actually putting that black portrait was really powerful. And in a way, I wonder whether that was more powerful than the, the new sketch that is that it, it's quite light and you can't really see it and well, not from the system. Of, and it's like. I've just taken my mic off, so I hope that doesn't matter. But um, it, we were really very strongly led by what the, the community-based group said about that. I don't know if Charles got that question, but there was a strong feeling amongst the Slave Trade Legacies group that that, that portrait, that inclusion of that portrait was not appropriate. I, I don't think everyone agreed with that, so there was, there was, there was some discussion. I, I could sort of see what the designers were trying to do. Um, there were actually three different portraits suggested, and that was the one they favoured. So we did look at a number. But you try finding an appropriate portrait of an enslaved person from that period. Yeah. It's so difficult. And Copley is an artist who is sympathetic to issues about, uh, 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 about um, liberation of enslaved peoples. As an artist, he has that reputation, but even, even so. And I think we came to the conclusion it, it also played down the linkages with other, other places yeah. and the contrib contribution of workers within the Durham Valley. So, I mean, I work as an academic on landscape, so that landscape for me has an, all sorts of problems with it as well. Um, but, but I think it was, it's never going to be perfect. And yeah. So we went really with that the community group view on the on the portrait or um, against the portrait. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I realise there's a tension there, isn't there? Uh, I, I, the questions at the end is really very pertinent. Uh, you know, to what extent can academics be anything other than relevant? Do we have to strive to take that position up? Because I mean, the, the point of framing the application for the project in the first place is not a disinterested one. You know, that's the first thing. And I think the second thing is absolutely nail on the head, the sustainability of projects which may only be either sequel funding or actually set up for what, three years and so on. I, I don't know whether there's an exact answer to that. I know that somebody in um, another university managed to get some work loan remission for an extension of maintaining a website or being a university PI for a research group. But I would say that's rare. And I think that there's a very material basis for why there is always a sense of you know, it's hitting and running and nothing really can be maintained after the expiration of the funding. And it's probably that. I've got to say that the community um, facilitation organisation we've been working with, Bright Ideas Nottingham, have been yeah. really proactive. And now there's a proposal to set that the group helps found a Nottingham Black History Society in its own right. And because it, it, it didn't have that sort of cohesion before, it was a 
the group was brought together as part of this initiative, although people had interests. But I think that's, that's a really positive thing, and it's coming from that grouping rather than from the university. So that's a positive thing. So I say off the back of that, the last one of these um, Heritage Network works was specifically on legacies. I'm just looking at Nick here, so some coordinates it. And this question of legacy and sustainability is a big issue in connected communities. Because obviously the whole theme has been about joining up communities and the question of legacy and how you make that sustainable is something that is being explored and is a big issue. Um, and as I wrote up a paper I gave at the last network conference on exactly that and all the others. And you're absolutely right, it's a big issue. We need to explore ways to make that work. Uh, and I think better connection with the sort of industry sector, if you like. I don't mean the you know, like industry, I mean people who work wider in social services and community work and joining up better with them probably about how to make these perspectives, these ways we discover of doing things well, how to, how to give them legs and then bend them it is the way forward because we can't do it all ourselves. Um, but again and again, the themes come up today, funding cuts, funding cuts, funding cuts, you know, it, it's very difficult to join that up and as academics I think it's a challenge for us, you know, to come up with imaginative solutions that can then be deployed. I don't say I've got those solutions right here in my pocket, but it's clearly something we should be working on. It's interesting that that Heritage Lottery funded visitor centre, I don't think that had any component initially about taking on board diverse histories. It was only that our project happened to come along at that time and happened to be asked to comment, which meant that got fed in. I mean, yes, absolutely. And I was going to say, you know, you've looked at the, the sort of minority ethnic sort of contribution, but obviously it alluded to the fact there's a huge vast way of people working locally in the industry at the time. Like you could almost have those four portraits of the Arkwrights and the Struts, and then almost a whole series of thousands of tiny portraits. Yeah. They're too small to even see because they're anonymous contributors whose role is overlooked, um, whether yeah. they're yeah. black, white, or anything in between. I think that's why we, we sort of went towards that landscape which did yeah. depict yeah. a wider range yeah, of Yeah, because the portrait itself, it's not a good medium for everyone, is it? 